Well, um, we've got lots to talk about, so we're going to dive right in. Um, but I'm going to start by asking, is climate change an issue that just sort of rallies the base and the people who are already converted, or does it, do you think, and how, drive new people to the polls? I think it's both. I think, uh, I think the most important issue that we should, uh, the most important issue on the polling of climate change is that it is trending upwards in support and salience. So more and more Americans feel like climate change is an important issue, and more and more Americans uh, are voting on that issue. The issue has been very polarized in the United States, and I, I should note that the United States is relatively unique for that polarization. Around the world, there are in other countries, both conservatives and liberals, uh, agree on the problem of climate and, and basically that much has to be done. So here in the United States, we have a different kind of challenge. Um, but uh, you see the salience of the issue in the Democratic primary. It is a, it is a core issue. In fact, in, mo in much polling in Iowa and New Hampshire, climate change has risen to be really the second um, most important issue after health care uh, often. And that's why you see s basically all of the Democratic candidates putting forward really significant uh, climate proposals. All right, so there was a Quinnipiac poll not long ago that showed that 50%, 56% now say climate change is an emergency, mm -hmm. all right? That's a, that's a big word. But when you look at where that falls, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, it's all over the place. Democrats, 84% of them say it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. Independents, 63% of them say it's an emergency. Republicans, 18% <laughs> say it's an emergency. So as you think about the salience of this issue and how candidates, Democratic candidates, are going to be projecting this, who are they talking to? The 84% of the Democrats they've already got? The 36% of the independents they don't have? Or the 81% of the Republicans who don't see it as an emergency? I think the, the way to think about this is that uh, they're talking to two constituents, really. It is the Democrats and independents who already agree. And then it's the independents and some of the Republicans that they need to persuade. Um, you know, I think, I think the truth is that these numbers, they seem very polarized, but the polarization has moved uh, to some degree. What, uh, just a few years ago, the numbers amongst independents was lower, and the numbers even amongst some Democrats was lower. And I think the, 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 the weather patterns we've experienced, the increasing information we've had, the IPCC report, um, has created much greater urgency, particularly amongst partic constituencies like um, younger voters. But I also think it's just now in the Democratic Party assumed that you have to have a bold climate change, a climate proposal to address what's happening. And that, that is something that we should be optimistic about. And the fact that a majority of independents, a strong majority of independents, uh, feel like it's a climate emergency is a, is, is a significant change and an opportunity. That is a solid majority. Any poll that you look at for about the presidential, and this is all mm -hmm. going to change, we've got a long ways to go, but suggest that this is going to be close. And it's probably going to come down to a few key states. So let's yeah. look at a few key states because sure. political messaging now is, is very particular. It's mm -hmm. directed to very um, individualized audiences through social media and other things. Mm -hmm. So let's take a state like Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Arguably, um, whoever wins Pennsylvania has a very good shot at the White House. Yes. Trump last We time. have learned that. You have learned <laughs> that. You didn't win Pennsylvania last time. Uh, Although, uh, in, in, the, in the midterms, Democrats did very well in Pennsylvania. Very well. So Pennsylvania is clearly in play. Pencils, Pennsylvania is also the third leading mm -hmm. coal producing state. There's a lot of fracking in Pennsylvania. The mm -hmm. energy industry is big in Pennsylvania. Um, Center for American Progress has done a big uh, climate plan, um, and it calls for basically pulling the plug on coal. Mm -hmm. And it calls for um, reducing fossil fuels. So that would hurt Pennsylvania's economy as currently constructed. So how does the climate message that calls for those actions that could hurt jobs in the near term in Pennsylvania get projected in this campaign cycle? So I think the most important thing to think about is the time horizon we're on. There is definitely an urgency of action and an urgency of action now. but. We have, our climate plan deals with two benchmarks, 
2030 and 20 and 2050. And I think the the challenge of climate and what makes it such a hard issue is that in generally speaking, we have called for a lot of trade-offs. We have called for people to reduce uh, carbon carbon consumption and that does mean challenges for industries. But I think the opportunity we have, which is different than where we were five or 10 years ago, is that we now have a, a, a growing and strong renewables industry. And what we have to do is recognize that we have to use the examples of renewables, but we have to also talk about a long-term glide path. I think the challenge is if we are for banning fracking immediately, that is a that is going to be a political challenge. And so I think what we have to do, and it's, you know, this is a part of leadership, this is a tough issue for a reason. If it were easy to solve, we would have solved it by now, is that we have to be focused on jobs that are good wage jobs. And one of the, you know, challenges of this debate is that many of the jobs that have been created are good paying jobs that they do not have, they are not unionized and other jobs are. But will your candidates who, who are stumping on behalf of the climate go to coal country and talk to coal workers? Yes. What will they tell them? I think they have to say really clearly that first you were sold a bill of goods about coal. You were, Donald Trump came here and said he was going to save coal country and coal, coal jobs are declining at the same rate they were declining before that we have a path to move us forward and to provide jobs for you, and that we have to actually be honest about what's happening. I think the challenge we've had in this space is people haven't been specific about creating jobs where they are. And a, a good example is Texas. We now have examples like Texas, an oil production state that has actually created many more jobs in the renewable space. And those are good paying jobs, and we have to use that example as an opportunity in a place so like Pennsylvania. So do you see climate change being an aggressive, on the ground, leading issue in the state of Texas? I actually think if you look at what happened in 2018, uh, Better Work campaigned for Senate in Texas and talked about climate change everywhere. And in he fact, lost. two he thirds, lost. he did. But he lost by two points in a state where Republicans outnumber Democrats by 10 points, nine points. Uh, it was the closest election ever. He he do. I mean, if we got if Democrats did two percent in Texas uh, next year, we'd probably win the country by three hundred and thirty. I shouldn't say we. They would win the country by over three hundred electoral votes. So I think this is I think this is an issue which is my argument to candidates is the Republicans have a playbook to scare people on climate. And they are going to do that whether you have a climate plan or you don't. So you actually have to get ahead of the issue and talk about how addressing climate can actually create jobs. And, and if we handle this transition right, we'll create you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs in parts of the country that have not seen job growth in many years. So let's look at another state. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a strange state, electorally, and that's Florida. Close as can be. I knew he was going to go to Florida when he said strange. Well, <laughs> hanging chads, right? You know, yeah, right? I mean, we I know. know we know Florida, yeah. right? And Florida is a gigantically coastal, you know, state. They they are they feel this very directly, but they've had a series of Republican governors and and administrations that have mm -hmm. downplayed climate. Um, so I'm curious again as to how the climate message would get targeted by a presidential campaign or statewide candidates to Florida in, in, in the 2020 cycle? Florida is a great example, which is that uh, the, the issue of climate is much clearer to voters, given the superstorms they've experienced, given the algae storm, the algae situation they had. People are recognizing it as, uh, as a challenge. And I think the issue is to- People are recognizing it as a challenge. Are, are you seeing, are you tracking numbers, climate numbers, polling numbers in Florida? Yes, a strong, major, a strong majority of voters in 20, in, in the last year have said that climate is a, real, is a big challenge for the state of Florida. Um, and those numbers have increased. I think the truth is that the superstorms have affected both Texas and Florida in unique ways and people whether they hear it from political leaders or not, believe that these the the intensity and frequency of superstorms are really moving are are a subject of are created because of man made climate change. So I think 
I, what I would say is you have to go to Florida. Donald Trump is going to go to Florida and say, this socialist Democrat is going to have a climate change plan that's a Chinese And the Green hoax. New Deal is 16 The Green New Deal, and it's going to raise your taxes, and he he's going to do that, like, as of now. So my, what I argue to campaigns uh, is that, and they're, you know, right now they're very much focused on the Democratic primary, so that is dominating their attention. But my argument to campaigns would be to aggressively go into states ahead of time and make the argument about how many jobs have been created from renewables, what the economic problems are for us when we don't deal with climate change, the economic struggles of Florida and Texas because of the superstorms. The long-term challenges, one of the most interesting aspects of this primary to me has been how many candidates have gone into Iowa and heard from farmers about the climate change problems they have because they were dealing with massive flooding all throughout the state. And they, the farmers themselves identify this as a climate crisis situation. And so you have candidates going, talking to farmers about the opportunities of climate change and how to invest with farmers and how they could actually address this problem. And I'd say, you know, if you said five or 10 years ago that farmers were going to be a new constituency for climate change action, people would have looked at you strange, so you're, but that is actually happening. So you're, you're telling your candidates to take the climate issue to farmers, to union workers, to coal miners, to people in Florida aggressively and, and unapologetically. And, and I, I think we have to, Democrats have to win the argument that climate action is good for the economy or they will be on the defensive.